started the workshop of today with the specification session that will include practical use cases as well as conformance testing. The first uh, speaker is Karin Bradenberg. She has uh, spoken already this morning. Uh, she's uh, our metadata strategist from uh, Sudar Kivera. Karin, I give the floor to you. Carl is also going to speak, so you can might as well introduce him too, because we have. Okay, I was thinking to introduce him before. Um... Uh, okay. So Carl Wilson is working for the Open Preservation Foundation. He's the technical lead overseeing the OPF's technical uh, activities. He's an experienced software engineer, and his professional interest is using virtualization, automation, and continuous delivery techniques to improve the software development process. Yeah, so as I perhaps not scared you before, now I'm going to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> so it's me and Carl, and we have, as, I, as we, I said, try to say, forgetting that when someone presses the red button, the, that microphone takes over. Uh, we have mixed our presentations because, uh, and made them in cooperation because it's so connected with conformance and specifications. So you're off for a ride. Uh, you already heard a lot of acronyms today. You heard the OAS reference model being named, and that's what we are using to facilitate the data transfer and conformance. So on the left side, you have the producer. And this picture is kind of boring. Let me introduce the OAS reference model for you. I'm going shopping. I go to the grocery store. I have my bag. That's my submission information package. That's what I'm bringing into my fridge. My fridge is my archive. Um, I'm not going to give any date on how long term it is, but I do fill it up regularly. In my archive, I can um, make some decisions. I can either just take my bag, putting it in as an archival information package, or I can actually split it up and sort my information or my groceries as uh, being belonging together, making that my archival information package. So for some reason, people think I'm a good cook. I don't know why. Uh, then I have two strategies for getting my information out or my groceries out of the fridge. I can either have been so prepared that my archival information package, uh, as it's life, as a submission information package, contained everything I needed to do my dissemination. So I just take my bag out and cook my meal. Or I might need to get the information from a lot of different packages to create my meal. Uh, we do end up in some strange talking when we say I cook my food. Is that data trustworthy still? I'm not going into this, uh, but this is the easy way to explain the OAS reference model to someone who doesn't really know what it is, because quite frankly, the image before is, it's from a standard, it's dry, it's boring. I'm happy I met people actually 13 years ago showing me this image, making it easy to explain the OAS reference model to everybody. We have also already been into the ways that the data can be used. And as I said previously, it's not just for archiving. Uh, down to the left, we have all the different ways of data being produced. We have a person working at an agency creating data, having it into the, a database. Uh, we have the general public using an interface delivering data. Uh, a citizen using an uh, e-service for telling my kids are sick and can't go to school today. Uh, we do an export from the system that uh, creates a number of files. 
and we will be talking about these files today. When we have these files, we are able to reuse and send them on in so many different ways. Uh, we can use them for starting and changing it to a new system. We can send, send them to another agency or municipality. We can send it out as open data. When the format is known, it's easy to reuse it. <clears throat> we can also pack it in a box, so my grocery bag, and put it into an e-archive. And both the e-archive and the files themselves can be given to whoever. So it's a lot of ways to use the information. We already had one standard question. Um, this image shows us or visualization of seeing standards. It's a couple of years old, but it shows all the metadata standards that existed about 10 years ago. Uh, you have them grouped in different sections showing where they are used. You also have them being the spiders in the top, having the standard and showing where it's used. This is really good to look at because this is all the things that we are handling today and a number of more ones. Showing also some of them are actually quite similar. You need to do some choices. Uh, if you want to print it, it's a large printer and it's about four meters long, up to five meters. But uh, don't try to print it on A4. I tried, I didn't succeed. Uh, it's good to have as a reference and, and show that it's a lot of standards around that we can use. With that, we have all these standards. What we need is actually to have a defined set of standards and specifications that we use together. So we limit the numbers so we know what we are using. And in the building block, we have these specifications today. You have heard about the CSIP, uh, and I'm going to talk more about all these, but we have a set of seven specifications now, right now that we have agreed upon and are using in the building block. So trying to take over here totally. Yes, of course, the image are in Swedish. Uh, when we use the same specifications, the preservation, migration, reuse, and trust of our data becomes easy. Uh, if we have used the specification September this year, if we open it 200 years later, they still can see what it was that we preserved today. We do have to do some migration and so on to make everything work, but we sure make the possibility to see it easier. <clears throat> so as I said, we have a number of specifications. There are two types of them, uh, one for the information package and one for the content information type. So if we start off with the box, my grocery bag, that is uh, an information package. We want to store the data somewhere when we transfer it. Uh, there are th four specifications for the package. The CSIP is the common one, defining all the bases for all the information packages. The SIP, AIP, and DIP are extending and putting on the special things that are needed in the submission case, in the arch uh, archival case, and in the dis dissemination case. But they are all based upon the CSIP. We don't want to write everything twice. We just write it once. So in the CSIP, we find the core principles for a package. Uh, we have a number of principles. Um, they tell you what makes a package a package. 
Uh, one of the important thing if we want to make it uh, trustworthy and accessible is to have it identified. So that's also part of the principles. Uh, the structure, what do we do if we don't have access to a specification? We need to somehow know what the information are. And we also talk about the metadata that is needed for the package to be able to reuse and preserve it. So chapter three of the CSIP is the general principles and so on. And then chapter four is how you structure the package. <laughs> this becomes really, really tiny. <coughs> uh, I think we are up to 130 requirements when you split them up. One thing in one requirement. No multiple ones, so it's easier for when Carl takes over. Uh, we use a standard named METS, Metadata Encoding and Transmission Standard, to utilize the package. Um, and all the elements are described using METS. So in the table, we have the requirement ID. We have a description of what it is and where it's found in the package. And also we give the cardinality. How is it supposed to be used? Is it mandatory? Is it optional? Can it be repeated? And we also have the extra trigger of saying if it must be there or not, just emphasizing the mandatoriness. <clears throat> You already heard Istvan talking about the content information type specifications. We have our box. We described our, our box with the help of the CSIP. Then we want to have information and data inside of it. Then there we use the content information type specifications. And why do we need them? One, a long time ago when I started working with this, someone said to me, oh, I think we only need one specification. We can describe everything in one specification. <coughs> I, no, we can't. Uh, you need to have one specification for all different kinds of information types because if you start putting them together in one specification, that specification will not be easy to use. The number of pages, I'm not even going to guess if we try to describe all the different kind of economical, economical data, databases. So it's all split up in different specifications. Let's put it this way to make it easy. And I think this is the best use case I have because if I'm going to start to talk <laughs> use cases, it's going to be a lot of XML and then you are not going to like me. Uh, we have a system, we have system, system number one. Uh, it has uh, its elements, record ID, case worker, title and date. Observe that the date is uh, four uh, numbers for year, two months and two date. Uh, we want to move this information to system number two, having the order and name of the uh, elements being title, day book number, caseworker and date, but date suddenly only have two years. So two letter uh, numbers for years. If we just take this information and just transfer it straight over, we copy table uh, and column for column to the new system, we are going to end up in a total mess. <clears throat> we will get a lot of day book numbers being named Kim. Uh, Kim is a person. And uh, it's going not to be easy when we want to find a certain case in the system, since if we search for Kim, we get, he's the only one working there, so we get all the cases. So it's really important to do as what, what we are doing, use a specification in between. So. We have the CS, CS in combination with the SIDS, where we actually tell which elements are available. And then it's easy to, from system one, to take them over to the SIDS 
through an export. Uh, observe that in the seats, we suddenly have uh, dashes between the different numbers in the date. And that also makes it easy to move it to system two because they know what they are getting. So that it's easy to transfer and implement in the new system. It also makes it easy when we have, the, have it in the archive to actually see and understand the information because everybody is using the same. So we can easily judge the data. The important thing with the SITs is that we aren't going to invent any new wheels. I think the round one is pretty perfect. Uh, we talked about SEAD earlier today. Um, we have based the uh, relational databases on, upon it. It's today, uh, yes, it's a Swiss standard, and as uh, Istvan said, it's worked in conjunction with the building block, so it has been updated. And it's actually SEAD.1 that is being used. It's also in the different content information types, uh, specifications where you see where the data is going to be put in that box. Since the box has different sections when you use the MET standard, and if we are going to talk the MET standard, it takes about four hours, so I'm going to spare you that. Uh, but you sort the information according to what it is. So we tell you in the, the different content informa information type specifications where you put the data, and where, which also gives everybody implementing it where they can find it. And we also tell what kind of type it is, and using a lot of different uh, vocabularies. So we say exactly what it is, so it's going to be handled in the correct way when it arrives where it's supposed to arrive. We do have some worker bees, um, not enough, as we have already heard. But the worker bees of the specifications are the DILSIS board. So the Digital Information Lifecycle Interoperability Standards Board, DILSIS, much quicker. In cooperation with people from the building block having different spe specialities. But the DILSIS boards are the maintainers of the specifications. and took over the specification that were, specifications that were drafted in the first EARC. And we are going to create some new seats, uh, one for archive with the description. And of course, we are not going to do that on our own. We already have Archives Portal Europe, who have specifications for archival description. We will work in cooperation with them. As I said, don't invent too many new wheels when the wheel, wheels are already there. We are going to work some more with the CR specification. Uh, as you know, a database can become rather huge. That means that not everybody will be able to handle one database export as just one package. It needs to be splitted. So we are going to give advice and tell how you split a large package. Geodata is in itself a huge area. We currently have one for geospatial data. We will look into one for Gs. Um, so depending on the information type, it might become more than one content information type specification because you can't mix them up. It's like looking at, the, as I mentioned, the economics. There are so many different ways. If it was just a specification for my ordinary keeping track of my money, it would be easy, but no. And we all know the number of regulations that we have existing for the economics. We are also going to look, have, uh, create a, a content information type specification for premise. Premise is the de facto standard for preservation metadata. And it's a standard that comes really not out of the box. You have to make a lot of decisions. So we are going to help everybody with the decision of, 
a basic premise profile. I already touched on this. Uh, as I said, we are a, a small number of people working with this, and we are experts, but we are not experts in everything. So we need to work together with others. So we are looking into certification and endorsements. Uh, we will come up with a conclusion uh, during these two years where we actually let the people who know the information and already have, most, in the most cases, created an, an uh, specification become part of the specification family in the e-archiving building block. I'm going to let you talk now. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Karen. So, yeah, I'm, um, as was announced earlier, my name's Carl Wilson from the Open Preservation Foundation, and I'm going to speak a little bit about um, software supporting, um, software we're developing to support um, the specifications and validation of information packages. Um, so first we'll begin by a look at the e-archiving validation process as it stands at the moment. Um, so first to build a case for automated support. Um, the picture on the right actually, so eARCs um, at one level is an interoperability standard um, to allow information exchange between disparate systems or different, um, even different countries. Um, and one of the reasons, okay, thank you. Yeah, and one of the reasons um, standards are necessary is the picture on the right represents railway gauges from different um, countries. Um, anyone who's ever taken a railway journey that meant changing gauge means it either means changing train or sometimes trains are moved from one gauge to another. Um, but a standard gauge helps that kind of interoperability. A standard, if everyone adopted one single standard, um, that interoperability is seamless. A train can travel from one country to another, a one rail system to another. Um, and to ensure that you meet a standard, um, that's why you require a validation tool of some kind. I mean, in the case of the railway gauges, the validation tool is simple, it's a ruler. Um, the standards we're using for archiving are considerably more complex for that than that. Um, and especially if you're starting out using these standards, it can be quite hard to know um, where to begin. Um, in particular, if you're looking to develop prototype packages within your organization, you want to know whether they meet the particular requirements um, or whether you're developing software for your organization or third party software and you would like to know that your, it, whether your software meets the standards, whether the packages, your information packages, your software produces meet those standards. And this is where the validation tools that we're producing hopefully st step in. We'll be providing validation software for users. So this would be end users. We are providing validation software for users. And this is end users in libraries um, and archives um, and other organizations. So these are, yeah, are my packages valid? Um, is an incoming package valid? Easy ways of validating packages and making sure they meet the standards. But we're also developing software libraries for um, software developers, both um, commercial software developers, but also in-house at organizations. So these are, again, packages, um, software that allows you to build validation into your own systems, information package validation to your own systems, but also underlying that there's a level of software that passes packages and allows you to work with packages, um, information packages. Okay. I'll have a look at the actual process itself as things stand at the moment. So we have a notion of a three-part process um, and there is a fourth missing parts, not missing quite at the moment, but a part we haven't looked at yet, and then I'll talk about that. So the three parts of the process at the moment are we check for structural conformance or well-formedness, um, syntactic conformance or validity, and then package integrity. And I'll say a little bit about those three steps. So well-formedness is the general package form, the form of the submission, and this will be checking for certain files that are expected to be um, within a package, particularly the main metadata file that drives the rest of the package structure. Um, but there also there's some standard folders that are expected by the specification as well. Um, so the first well-formless check will 
basically ensures the expected files and folders are in, are in place. Um, and that's a fairly lightweight check. Um, the second part is testing the validity of the package. And at this, level, at this level, we actually pass the metadata files, all the standard METS files that have been provided in the package. We validate them against the schema. We apply additional um, metadata schema that, um, that we've adopted as part of the ARC, and we'll say a little bit about, about those additions later. Um, and then run a set of schematron checks um, over that data, which it forms an extra level of checks beyond the schema. Um, I'll say a little bit about Schematron later as well, but that's the validity stage. And then finally, we have <coughs> what we call integrity checking. Um, so once we're happy that the packets are well-formed and valid, um, we then start to look actually at the contents. And so this would be things like ensuring that the content files that are listed in metadata actually exist within the packet, and verifying any checksums supplied, and also looking to ensure that there's no orphan files in the package, i.e. files that start, sit in the package that have no metadata reference anywhere and maybe look as if they're there by mistake. Um, they might be really simple things such as operating system files that some operating systems will leave, but they could be things that have genuinely mi missed out. The one thing that isn't mentioned in this slide but we are looking at would be validation against the content information types, the SITS level. Um, this is different levels of specification. So at the moment, if you um, supply CR data, um, we could tell you the package was... Um, in good shape, and we could even tell you the files that were supplied were the files that were expected, and they haven't been um, damaged in transmission. But the only thing we, we, the one thing we don't have at the moment is we don't plug in the content type, so there wouldn't be validation of the actual CR data, the specialist data, the domain specific data within the package. But that's something we are working on, we'll be working on with our um, content information type suppliers over the second phase. Okay. Um, so just to look at what, we're, what we are producing, um, beyond as, as well as software, before we can actually produce the software libraries, um, we need to be able to produce these validation, valid, a set of validation rules. And to do that, we need some data to test on. So actually what we're making is, starting from the bottom, is test packages. So these are sample information packages that actually we go through the specification clause by clause and produce packages that are broken in a specific atomic way so that we can test whether a validator can d detect um, violation of a particular clause. Um, from those packages, that we then build <coughs> shareable and reusable validation rules. These are the Schematron validation rules that sit above the um, XML schema themselves. Um, and then we use those rules to build validation software libraries and on led on top of that is an online validation service. Um, so the validation software libraries, um, that includes the end user software as well. Um, I'll say a little bit more about all these elements still as I go over the next slides. Um, so a closer look at what we're producing, how we're going about doing that. Sorry, I've skipped two slides. OK, then. So um, why is the test data important? Um, well, for various reasons. We're producing the test packages first to test our own validation rules and our own validator. But actually, the test um, corpus will become a standard by which other software producers can judge their own compliance against the ARC standards. So the first test for your software is to run it over our corpus and make sure it gives the right answers, um, not just whether a package is valid or invalid, but we will be expecting particular error messages for the different packages. Um, and that test data is important because we're using that to actually check our own validation rules. Um, and so at the moment, we build test packages, we build a validation rule to match, we test one against the other, and then gradually this becomes a corpus of test data and rules that form an entire validator for the EARC standards, um, or certainly the information package standards. Um, and the test data also allows us to um, establish a baseline. Um, one of the hidden benefits of producing this test data is actually it tests our understanding of our own specifications as well. We're writing these specifications. They're relatively new. Um, they're only just gaining a adoption. And they're quite long documents. They have three-figure numbers of clauses in them. They're fairly detailed. And very often when you're writing specifications in that way, it's easy to have various elements in a specification that contradict one another that are not necessarily consistent. 
actually producing the test packages helps us to test this level of consistency to make sure that we understand our own specification well and it's tested. So we use the production of the test corpus to QA our own um, specification production process. And then on top of that, we can then use them to build validation rules and validators. Um, and a quick word about the validation rules. So I say we're using re reusable rules. We're using um, a technology called Schematron. It's another XML schema, um, but it allows you to test for patterns within XML documents and um, beyond simple schema ones. Um, so you can write your, your own rules and test that if you have a particular clause here that there's only a certain value used somewhere else. Um, the kind of things we, we have written in the specification but aren't are difficult to implement in schema or are too specialist for METS, for a more general schema like METS, which is meant to be reusable by lots of organisations. We're looking for rules that are actually specific to the ARC information package specifications. Um, the reason we're using Schematron is then you have the, they actually, the Schematron actually implements the rules and the checks. That can be incorporated into most programming environments, most languages. So we have a set of view rules that can be used across different software packages, which gives us this consistent implementation. It's those Schematron rules that we're quality checking against the test corpus. So that allows us to quality assure these rules. And as long as people stick to using the Schematron rules, it should be the same rules and a consistent um, validation process across different software environments, different software. Um, and finally, I'll just have a look at where we're going, what we're making, and how you can help, um, how you can join us. Um, so again, one of the most important elements is this software. Our, we'll be producing software that's meant to support people looking to take up the EARC specifications. Um, this will in, include help for people getting started information packages. The first, um, the first step may be the online validator. So. You don't need to install any software yourself. You can create a package, upload it to a, a website, and get a, an answer as to whether that package is valid and what was wrong with it. Um, but we're also providing support for ERC at Ivin developers. So this is deeper software libraries for third-party developers. Um, some of those are third-party um, third commercial organizations are actually working with the ERC um, project. Some. But, these are, meant, these are open source, um, open license, and meant to be used. They'll be licensed in such a way that anyone can use them. Um, we want to encourage adoption rather than, um, like, than <coughs> put people off. So we'll be using permissive licenses, and we're willing to relicense more permissively at times if it helps, because we're not looking to make money out of the software in particular, but we're really looking for that software to generate adoption and use. Um, and also that software library would be usable by your own in-house um, in-organization. If, if you develop software in-house, you would still be able to use those libraries um, in-house to, so you don't have to develop these, this kind of software um, from scratch. And again, this should provide a consistent um, validation service across different software packages and even in in-house software. Um, one of the things I would like to encourage you to do is try and join our e the archive community. So, as well as open licensing, we're really trying to focus on open processes for the development of the specifications, the test corpora, the validation rules, and the software itself. Um, all of these things are available on GitHub. There's a slide later that gives specific um, projects. Um, whether it's a comment on the specification, um, finding a bug in the software, you notice a mistake in a test package, you suggesting a different test package, you can either log an issue or you can actually contribute yourself and particularly test cases test packages would be interested in contributions but if you're a software developer and you can you, you find a bug you can offer the contribution as well all of this is done through the standard github um interface you do need a github account to to take part but that's free and i'm hoping it will remain free the only cloud on the horizon is microsoft bought github within the last year so it may change but it's it's a well-established um platform for open open software collaboration and that's i'll hand back to karen i might get you to talk anyway uh, so as you understand we do need some help from some friends it's not as i said well as you can hear it's not not the thing you do alone neither 
creating specifications or the conformance. So for, for using the specifications, there are some, some supporting elements needed. Uh, I think you heard earlier today talk about training and oh boy, yes. <laughs> I don't expect everybody to know maths. Well, yeah, I do. But I know I'm uh, being part of the board. I'm for maths. I'm, I'm kind of have taken a lot of classes in it and give classes. So no, I don't expect you to know maths when you leave today. Um, but maths is based as on an XML schema. Um, the specifications we have today, most of them, or all of them, are using an XML schema, but it might be other schema languages that will be used. But we need to be able to, as Carl said, validate the information and validate that it at least is well formed and following the schema. Validating the content that has been entered, that's another story. And that also often comes down to the national regulations. What are you supposed to write in the elements? Because we come into the different ways of telling names of things. So e-translation will be a huge help there. Uh, we have the schematron documents uh, down to the right. Since XML schemas themselves are really restricted in the rules they can write, if you want to test, for example, that if I have the element name, I need to have the element last name. That is not a, not a thing the XML schema itself can do. It, it needs to be implemented in Schematron. So saying this, I know a lot of you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, all this is needed to be done in cooperation between different professions. You need the archivist. You need the information spe specialist, which might be the archivist. You never know. Uh, but you also need the technical people, programmers, people knowing the standards. So if you th think you can implement an e-archiving solution on your own, you can't. And we have the support of the building block. We have the help desk, so you have a lot of resources, but still you need to be able to contact all the correct people in your organization to be able to do it because it's a work in cooperation. As I said, I'm totally a nerd when it comes to specifications. I know the standards, I know I'm I don't have too many people to speak with because I know the standards down to the last element. Um, we need to have guidelines on how to implement the specifications and how to use them. Uh, we need examples. Uh, and it needs to be examples that like the test packages, but we also need that for the different content, type, content information type specifications. Uh, you need detailed explanations on some parts of the specifications. And as you already heard, a big thing is going to be training in specifications. It's uh, not uh, too many knowing all the, all the standards that are needed to be used. We need to become more. So training will be offered there. I think you can take this one. Okay, yeah. We, um, so, again, just to reiterate, we're looking to produce online services for non-technical users, and this is really aimed at end users, um, at non-technical users, as I say. Um, we're producing command line software for batch processing research researchers. It's it's unclear whether we'll produce, it's unlikely, in fact, that we'll produce a windered version for end users. It would be almost certainly command line, um, just windered software is awkward, awkward to produce and probably unnecessary if we have the online service. Um, and then finally, this idea of software libraries for in-house and commercial developers. So this should allow you to just bake um, the validation process in and uh, 
to a large degree, the passing and reassembling of, of your own information packages as well within software using software libraries that we provide. Um, actually, technical details there is we're intending to produce or in the process of producing two software libraries. We have had a Java one initially and the elements of a Python one. The idea is that by sharing the validation rules, we don't have to implement that across two libraries, the validation. They will share, but we will produce a Python library and a, um, a Java library that, so we have both at the moment, but they're not, they don't quite mirror each other correctly. Um, they're not analogous to each other totally, but they, those two libraries will be analogous, so that should support two of the main software development um, environments that people use today. So we have Python and Java libraries that are hopefully um, We'll use it. We'll, we're using one library to test the other is the idea as well. So it helps us with our own internal testing, but that should ensure that they're consistent so it shouldn't matter which you adopt. Um, yeah, and Carl has already mentioned GitHub. Uh, if I'm pressing the correct button, this will work much easier. So, as Carl said, um, currently GitHub is the largest host of open source software. Uh, it has been bought of Microsoft, but I still haven't seen any signals of them doing anything yet, but you never know. And it has an infrastructure that we can use which uh, aids with the openness. So, for example, the Dilses board, all our nodes from our meetings are available on GitHub, so everybody can read them. So it's an easy way to share everything we do, so we are open. It also give, gives us in this, it did look so much better on my screen, small screen at home. Uh, all the versions of the specifications are available in the GitHub repository. Uh, having been working with this for so long as I have done, I know that you never know which verse, version someone else has implemented. That means that all the versions need to be available long term. Uh, it takes time to implement specifications. I know that. It's not a thing you do overnight. I would like it to be like that, but it takes a lot of decisions, the management decisions, the people working, doing it, and so on. So it will take time for everybody to be on the same version, which means all versions need to be available. All the different schemas need to be available. Uh, looking at the standards we are using, we also need them to have their schemas available in the old versions. So. If one standard makes an update, as for the implementers, also for us providing the specifications, it takes some time before we have updated to the latest version. So always the old things need to be available and for a long time. What we also use GitHub for, as Carl mentioned, or talk and talked about is the issues. Uh, we had a review for these first seven specifications, ending up with a lot of GitHub issues. They are all in get GitHub. And you can see the discussions we have had about them. Uh, we have other people um, submitting issues. And as also been mentioned, don't forget the service desk, but the service desk might cause us to create an issue in GitHub. But there you can really see everything we have been talking about, everything we have been handling. So it's all there. So coming to some sort of conclusion, uh, we have had data saved for a long time. When I get mad at people and think they shouldn't do working digital, I still reference the stones outside. We have a huge number of them in Sweden, and you still can get the hammer and the chisel. Uh, we still can read them. Uh, we do have, if you look at the language used from the Viking Age, they do leave some letters out, 
and you still can understand the information. We do have an issue when we move over to digital. If we lose a one or a zero, we can't read it anymore. So when we go to the digital, we need to be take more care of having all the metadata we need to be able to read it in the future. So, yeah, I'm kind of, as I guess everybody re already have noticed, I, I can be kind of nasty. But we can put the ones and zeros into a stone, but we can't miss them, I mean, miss one of them. And also, it's a community effort. This is not a thing we can do, anyone can do on, on their own. We need to work together with the specifications and the conformance. Uh, as we add more conformance testing, as Carl said, we need to know about the other use cases, the one we haven't thought about. Uh, we also need to work together with the different content information type specifications, create examples. Um, it's easy for me to create a Swedish example for our content information type specifications, uh, but we need to have them in multiple languages, in multiple uses. Since all, we all have different national regulations, we need that help to actually get the examples. Because making an example up is easy, but making that example suitable for everybody is not easy. So my big thing today is to say that we need to use the same standards and specifications. We need to do the choices. As you remember from the beginning, we do have a lot of standards to use. Which should we use? And if we decide that together, it's so much easier to handle the information transfers no matter where the information will end up. I'm handing over to you, Carl. So yeah, and a similar story for the conformance testing and conformance um, testing software. This is designed to make the preservation, migration, and reuse and, of your data and therefore establish trust in that data, and it's, it's meant to make that easy. Um, I'll talk briefly again about, so there is this last level of content type validation within packages. Um, that's the bit that's going to be less standard. Um, our, our aim there is not to develop specific content type validators ourselves, it's to look within the domain and leverage existing um, software and standards within the domain, hopefully. So we won't be developing specialist content type validators ourselves. Yeah. I'm stealing that one even if we are close, but um, so we are here. Uh, I know we haven't deep dived into all the d different specifications we have, because then I know you would have left. Uh, we have just touched the surface. Uh, there are education needed. We are aware of that and so on. But we left plenty of time for questioning now. So feel free to ask the questions you want to have answered now. or. Send them to the service desk and we will reply afterwards, but take the opportunity when we are sitting here. So steal the microphone. I'm Zoe Casara uh, from the European Union Aviation Safety Agency as well. Um, I understand that um, we, regardless where our uh, data, documents or records reside, we can take up e-archiving, right? We can migrate uh, migrate our data or documents or the short answer is yes of course and uh, could you describe in a bit more detail or in a way that i can understand um, the, this collaborative uh, effort to together for example set uh, the specifications or creating the create the testing packages so what what input is provided by the by you, so by the team, by the CEF uh, team or this SMO, or the, and what is effort and input is uh, 
requested on our side and estimations, if possible, I don't know. I understand that each case, of course, is different. Um, not to mislead or to be clear, we'll be developing this, the, 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 um, both the specifications and the software regardless. We're not relying on external input, um, but, it's, but we won't get everything right. There will be bugs in the software. There will be anything from typos to um, mistakes in specifications. I mean, we are inhuman and we will make mistakes. And it's really that second level of checking that we're hoping for from the community rather than direct effort. Um, direct effort would be great, don't get me wrong. But yeah, um, we don't really expect, necessarily expect. We, we get, um, one example was the review of the specifications. We basically threw that, once we had the drafts, release drafts ready, and we threw those open for a review process where people were you could comment either as a, raise an issue on GitHub. The nice thing about raising an issue on GitHub rather than, or you could send by email or the CEF desk possibly as well would be another way, maybe not for, for um, minuter on the specification as a help desk um, thing. But once again, they would all be funneled through to, through to us in the end. The advantage of doing it on GitHub is you, for, for things like the specification is you can focus on a particular line, you can provide links, um, and it's kind of tied with the specification. But yeah, we basically triage the um, all of the feedback we got in the specification from email or on GitHub issues. We created a set of GitHub issues then that we then worked off um, and basically we tick off as we as we work through them. Um, and again, the other nice feature about using a platform like GitHub is you can tie the contribution off with the issue. So it's the case of this this change fixes this, tie the two <laughs> together and sign them off. But yeah, we yeah, we're not expecting we're not expecting help for us to get us to get us past the finishing line. It's just to make the end results better. And also, when it comes to you says you say aviation, you have some standards and specifications on your own. I have a big feeling of, and of course, you can use them in a package. And of course, I think you have you are using the same specification among all the different aviation thingy thing is, whatever groups you are, those would be really nice to be able to raise and say, this is an e-archiving functional specification. So that's where we need to work together and we are going to create a guideline for how endorsement or certification will be, but we won't remake an avi aviation specification, even if I think that would be fun, but that's me. I don't think the rest thinks so. So, so we need there. We need to work together. So you get the specifications you are needing for aviation to put in the archival information package that we have the uh, already defined. So there is where we need really need to work together because I can't put my hand in that aviation thing. <laughs> no, I can't wait. <laughs> I tested a new Airbus on the way here. Of course I need to test aviation. Someone else? I would like to ask you how the co cooperation within the commission looks like. Do you have other DGs which, um, which are also using this facility? And do you cooperate with Digit? How does it, how can I, how can I picture structure so do you mean the cooperation inside the e-archiving or the uptake of e-archiving in other offices of the Commission rather the uptake who uses it and how do they use it and are you in connection with them or do they do it on their own organizational basis. Thank you. Yeah, um, as far as we know, there are only two, uh, two offices or two entities which are using e-archiving. The first one, I am not going to explain it. You will see this afternoon is the publications office. Actually, I was there when we were reusing it but we were not even aware that we were using the archiving. We were using the software, the specifications and so, but we were not aware that we were 
using actually the, the building block. But you will see that this afternoon. The other uh, I just mentioned before is the historical archives. They were at the beginning of the uh, definition of the specifications. And unfortunately, they couldn't come today. But we will find out more <coughs> during next week when we will set up a meeting with them. So, And these are the kind of uh, successful stories that we are looking forward to, to publish. So. Uh, so the historical archives also use, may use it, or yeah, because we is, work together with them in our institution. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Any other, yeah. Any other question before uh, we break? Last chance. <laughs> Thank you. Perhaps a uh, not so smart question, <laughs> but if are the specification language language independent or how does it how different uh, or information uh, in different languages is pro processed? We, we have one standard, right? We do not need uh, to translate standards or <laughs> um, well, yes, the standards are in English, and we try to keep using English standards. <coughs> Sorry, we have some letters in Swedish that you don't want to see, uh, which also makes it quite, kind of impossible to share the data. The specifications we have written are in English. If you want to translate, that's up to you, but if we keep them in English, it's easy for everybody.